Hey people, Mark here, with a video I cannot believe it took me this long to come up with. Back in July, I came out with a video explaining the shipmaking practices of the alien races of Halo, and every known pattern of them that we've seen or heard. Go ahead and middle mouse click that corner if you're interested in that, but I'll have to redo it eventually, including a couple I missed, and add a more accurate title and thumbnail, not to mention the fact that this video ended up a lot more organized than that one, but for whatever reason, I, I never thought to do the same for humanity. It seems like a no-brainer in hindsight, but whatever, we're doing it now. I'll mention dozens of ships in this that I haven't done extended breakdowns for, but don't worry, as I said in the Corvettes video, if a ship exists in the Halo canon, I will get to it and give it the, uh, well, not the most detailed breakdown treatment, I'm not that smart, but I'll give it my best. While I tried to include every named class, I did skip all the named ships we have no class or visuals for, just something to keep in mind. Oh, also, no aircraft in this one. A plane isn't a ship, but a spacecraft is, even if it looks like a plane and can also fly in atmosphere. Got all my nonsensical and arbitrary arbitrary rules down, great. The manufacturing process for human ships is both more and less straightforward than it is for the Covenant. Human starship manufacturing in Halo is much closer to what we can expect to see out of humanity if we ever make it out of this blue trap bubble. The pieces are put together separately and assembled in shipyards like the ones found orbiting Mars or Luna, formerly known as the Moon. We gotta start calling it that, guys. We're getting there. The UNSC doesn't design or assemble ships in-house like the Covenant did, instead contracting the owners of said shipyards and other ship component manufacturers to piece together the entirety of the UNSC Navy. Those manufacturers most notably include Synoviet Heavy Machinery, who appear to be the United Earth Government's favorite vendor. Others include Aerofabrique, Reyes McLees Shipyards, Kushan Shipyards, Martian Metal Shipyards, the Oros Trading Company, Al Anderson Shipyards, Rea Station, Tansec AB, Halifax Spaceworks, Vosper Engineering, something called Dudden Sky Gmb, and more. All warships would be managed and operated either by the Colonial Military Authority or the UNSC under the direction of the Colonial Administrative Authority or the United Earth Government, respectively. But we'll start with civilian ships, to switch it up a bit. There are actually a fair amount of these in Halo, and I think I may be in the minority here, but I love learning more about these sparsely discussed things even more than the military stuff. The sci-fi geek in me is vibrating to hear more about the fucking space trucks. Now, the civilian ships of Halo are glossed over quite often, so I might miss a few, and there are definitely going to be some gaps in our knowledge about them. The most obvious use of spacecraft for civilians is transportation, as everyone isn't going to be working in space. Most of the time, they'd be traveling from planet to planet if they leave their world at all. But before that, they'd have to leave Earth to get the process going. After a planet has been scouted and its solar system mapped out by scout ships like the Huygens class survey ship or the unidentified class that the CMA Argo belong to, the colony ships roll in. The colony ships are somewhat standardized across the board, that is to say there's not that many different types, the original Phoenix class colony ship being the most famous. I did a video on these and the most famous of the class, the Spirit of Fire, you can find it in the top right. These and the Euphrates class colony ships are known to land on a planet and become the seed for an entire civilization, being taken part for supplies and power generation once they land. Many of these were built at the same time as the Odyssey, the largest colony ship humanity ever made, and the first to colonize any world, that being Epsilon Eridanus II, which would come to be known as Planet Reach. The Banta-class colony ship or ferry is nowadays used for normal transport, ferrying people and cargo through space. My second favorite has to be the Star Charter-class colony support ship, which I also talk about in my Spirit of Fire video. There is one class of colony ship we have no name for, but most of you have actually seen. This ship appears in 2589 in the epilogue of Halo Reach, which takes place 29 years after Halo Infinite. To this day, it's most likely the most advanced human ship that has ever been shown in Halo. Just looks like a forerunner ship, honestly. As for dedicated transport vessels meant for moving between already established colonies, none are more ubiquitous than the Egret Space Liner, essentially a flying space coach capable of carrying hundreds of passengers and tons of cargo. The same can likely be said about the Brumel class mast, which we get no visual visual or description for. Orbital taxis are unmanned transports that take passengers from orbital stations to the surface. The HRB Flintlock was a securities transport ship owned by the Harris Romner Bank, so basically a space armored car. On the more luxurious side of things, you have the Hades class yachts and the Rivado class schooners, civilian transports built with the comfort of their wealthy passengers in mind. We don't have any visuals for these, so here's a, a really cool, like, space boat from Star Citizen or something. The 890 Jump. That's what it's called. Yeah, that's my favorite Star Citizen ship. I don't care. Come at me. I know it's a big boat in space. It looks awesome. The Hades-class yachts were apparently the basis for the UNSC schooner, which we know very little about. Moving on from personnel transports to cargo haulers, you have many options to choose from. 
The Mariner class transport, which I have done a video on, is a sleek, highly sought after transport with plenty of cargo space and the ability to be operated with a small crew. The Ace of Spades, captained by the daughter of Sergeant Forge, was a heavily modified variant of the Mariner. The Mulzac class transport is noted for being economic, adaptable, easy to maintain, easy to modify after purchase, and coming in a number of configurations. Freighters are ships that serve the sole purpose of transporting cargo from place to place, most of them being operated by the UNSC Department of Commercial shipping as a part of the UNSC commercial fleet. The most commonly seen freighter is the creatively named DCS Light Freighter and its variations, built solely to carry stuff from star to star. Many of these are totally automated and piloted by navigation computers, so dumb AIs. The Parabola class freighter had hydroponics facilities and could carry enough food and water to supply a small city. The UNSC Nareed was a freighter that looks strangely like some kind of frigate or something. The Bactrian class freighter is a tug and interplanetary transport vessel that only needs two crew members to operate. Laden class freighters were also tugs, albeit probably a bit longer. They were used by the Eridanus rebels, most likely modified for combat, as well as the keepers of the One Freedom who had one of these things. That's pretty weird. There's this unnamed tug that looks like a human tried to build a spirit dropship, as well as the behemoth class tug we never get to see. The Ibis class freighter, which is commonly mistaken for an albatross, but we'll get to that one later. The Mona Lisa Oni prison ship was also former a freighter, the Brahmin class light freighter, and the Markor's heavy lifter were both mules, which are rugged cargo haulers built for work in harsh environments like Meridian, which was a partially terraformed uh, planet after it had been glassed. Not a great place to live. The Genet class intrasystem hauler is what it sounds like. It moves between planets at sublight speeds to retrieve and deliver cargo, derelict ships, and asteroids. And Pilgrim's Pride was a freighter of unknown class that was in service to the new colonial alliance after the human Covenant War. The industrial sector in the Halo universe has, as it likely will in real life if we get there, no shortage of spaceships that perform various duties. The Spring Hill class mining ships are probably the most well known thanks to Sins of the Prophets. They're primarily used for mining and transporting resources between worlds, but were sometimes used during the war as ordnance transports. The newer Estum class mining ship, which we have no visual for, apparently dominates interstellar travel lanes as one of the most commonly seen ships in human space. The Bustler class freighter took part in the construction of new ships, and two assisted the floatout of this particular Autumn class cruiser. With this many ships going in and out of orbits, and pirates and rebels aplenty, a great deal of coordination is needed between solar systems for things to run smoothly. That's what couriers are for. Either having their own slipspace drive or hitching a ride on navy or civilian ships capable of housing them, couriers were used before the mid-2500s to manually deliver communications from system to system using a large data storage bank. The Vancouver class courier is considered the most prominent, and probably largest due to its ability to carry 40 passengers, including the pilot and co-pilot. The Gypsum class courier has no visual representation, but it and the Zheng Ho class are considered capable and efficient compared to other couriers. Once a human ship arrives in a human system, it needs protection from the dastardly pirates and insurrectionists in search of booty. Yar. Police cutters are the most basic idea of these protections, most likely similar to the Coast Guard or those police boats you see and wonder, how exactly do they catch the guys when they're all on boats and then you never google it? With a similar size and usage, the Minotaur class patrol vessel is one of my favorite small UNSC ship designs. It does the same thing as you'd expect a police cutter to do basically. These things, I, I just, I love how different these things look. And now moving on finally to what you've all been really waiting for. The Wet Navy. What, they're ships? Anyway, the Crassus class supercarrier is a seaborne warship that the UNSC Army uses for surface operations. Okay, on to actual warships now, sorta. Many non-combat vessels supported UNSC fleets. Ammunition ships like this one seen crash-landed on the planet Chorus, uh, I mean, uh, Partition. They supplied fleets with munitions and other material, most likely where ships would go to restock on Mac rounds or coil gun slugs, that kind of thing. UNSC refit stations served a similar purpose with the bonus of including areas where ships can be repaired or modified. The anchor stations around Reach were examples of these, as well as the cradle variation. I just did a video talking extensively on all the corvettes, top right corner if you haven't seen it, but we'll cover them all quickly here. The Sharpfin class corvette, which we never see, is one of the oldest and considered outdated, but is still used for escort services. It's popular with pirates as well. Same story with the Mako class. Uh, yes, that's how I say Mako class, alright? Because it's not like I say, oh look outside, there's a, there's a Mako walking down the street. Yeah, it's not a word people say often 
Griffin, that's how I pronounced it. I watched The Legend of Korra when I was younger, and his name's Mako, spelled like Mako, and his name's Mako. The Mako class has no visual representation. <laughs> but it has been given a new non-canon look by Choke Point Games, you know, the creators of Sins of the Prophets and various other Halo-based games. And personally, that means the look is canon until proven otherwise, but you didn't hear that from me. The Skolt class missile corvette was introduced as a frigate, but over time became underpowered for that role, now punching higher than its weight class due to its plentiful missile armament for its size. The Gladius class heavy corvette has more point defense than any other corvette, as well as being the most well armored and having some missiles to boot, although not as much as the previously mentioned vessel, obviously. And the Lancer class fast attack corvette was the fastest ship humanity ever had when it was introduced sometime after the 2490s, and it excels at coordinated hit and runs, behaving like a large fighter. And the Gal Patrol Corvette, which we have no visual for, is a very unique ship, being the only human ship to utilize plasma weaponry. Ah, the famed Prowlers. I've yet to talk about these extensively, but don't worry, we'll get there. I'll hit you with Prowlers of the UNSC one of these days. Prowlers are the UNSC's stealth ships, and boy do they come in a lot of flavors. Sub-Prowlers are an umbrella term applied to many small craft, be they troop carriers or some other such vessel, that were usually but not always deployed by larger Prowlers for covert ops. Okay, I cannot read all these at once for whatever reason that I can't read this line at one go. So here we go. Black Cat class sub prowlers, Chiroptera class sub prowlers, and U81 condors are all stealth exfiltration craft that are so good at their job even the audience can't see them. Take a look at these official designs, so cool. The D-102 Owl insertion craft aren't considered sub-prowlers, but they are a cross between them and more traditional dropships like the Pelican and the like. UNSC sloops were also stealth-capable small ships described as a cross between a corvette and a prowler. There are no visuals of them, so this is just a, a sloop on Earth. As for the full-on prowlers, the smallest of the bunch is the Winter Class Prowler, or the Winter Class Stealth Corvette. It's also used as a VIP transport vessel and for deep space reconnaissance. The UNSC last gleaming was a weird little prowler we once saw that we don't know what class it was, but it doesn't look like any of the others. This weird stealth ship was in a mission of Halo 5. This unidentified class appears in the Mona Lisa, and it basically does what you'd expect from a prowler. It has been suggested that this is a visual representation of the Eclipse Prowler, which, like the Razor class Prowler, has no visual representation. This heavy Prowler has appeared on a book cover in the form of the UNSC Toracado. We don't know much about these either. The most commonly shown and featured Prowler, though, is easily the Sahara class Heavy Prowler. It's considered the largest and most well armed, fitted with nuke delivery devices as well as nuke mines. This thing is cool and has me excited to do the Prowler video sometime. But cooler than that is the next entry, the Point Blank class Prowler, and I gotta be honest, probably the coolest looking ship in the entire UNSC straight up. Like, wow, like, hello, what? This is the only Prowler considered a stealth cruiser rather than a Corvette, not only because it's the biggest Prowler, but it has the most extensive armament as well. Ah, the most viewed video on my channel. I mean, the most commonly seen UNSC warships. Seriously, I think a frigate appears in every single Halo game except Combat Evolved, and there's literally one human ship throughout that whole game. Halo 2's frigate, the first one ever shown, is the stalwart class light frigate, one of the smallest built for planetary defense and troop and munitions deployment, but having a well-rounded naval armament. Halo 3's frigate was the Karin class light frigate, or Karin class, however you want to say it, with even more focus placed on troop and materiel deployment with a huge landing bay on its underside. Halo Reaches was the Paris class heavy frigate, more suited to the rigors of space combat than either of its other previous relatives with a larger armament than the two to boot. Halo 4's was the strident class heavy frigate, with the most tonnage, heaviest armament, and longest profile of any frigate to date. Halo 5's is the strange phenomenon of the Anlace class light frigate, the only UNSC ship to have an armament completely made up of energy weapons, specifically lasers, not plasma, while also being the smallest frigate the UNSC ever put out. And Halo Infinite's was the Mulsan class light frigate, or Mulsan, armed with, instead of a mech, its spinal mounted Bright Lance capital scale laser. I think the Mulsan is pretty cool, even if the model isn't really meant to be looked at too closely. One of my favorites, honestly. Now, the Skolt class Corvette that we talked about earlier was originally built to be a frigate, and at the time, we know it replaced the Osa and Akita class. Now, we never get to see those, but we can extrapolate from this that those two were probably also frigates from like the 2300s or so. Yet another compilation video, I've got to get around to remaking at some point. The destroyers of the UNSC are powerful frontline warships that hit harder than a frigate, but typically lack the tonnage or fleet coordination capability of a cruiser or carrier. These have powerful armaments and are meant to drive that 
nail into the coffin of enemy vessels. There are various unknown classes of destroyer, like the light destroyer that took part in the Callisto incident, which set off the bulk of the insurrection. At the same time, the Hillsborough class destroyer and the Able class heavy destroyer came to the forefront as some of the first ships to have ship mounted Max that weren't carriers. The Diligence class light destroyer, which was originally introduced as a cruiser, was also refitted to have two Max as a part of its armament. Finally, and most recently as it was commissioned in 2508, everyone's favorite, the Halberd class light destroyer, is the most long lasting of the category, as it had more viable usage cases against the Covenant than its bulkier, slower, generally less versatile relatives, the Able and Hillsborough. The Spinny Pillar Boys, the first ships we ever did see in Halo. The cruisers are the UNSC's preferred capital ship, or at least they grew into that role as the carriers were built for a war against innies that would be mostly ground-based. However, the carriers proved to be very costly in manpower and monies when the Covenant rolled around, so we see an increased focus on cruisers as the war goes on. The Halcyon-class light cruiser is known for its honeycomb structure, granting it the ability to tank damage and keep functioning beyond what was possible of other cruisers and, and smaller ships, but this was only the case for 11 of the 50 50 Halcyons that were built. In 2525, some of these ships were refit with an expanded armament, including the most famous of the line, the Pillar of Autumn. The Marathon-class heavy cruiser has a modular design, allowing it to work as a command ship, light carrier, and troop transport. They're considered one of the most powerful warships humanity has. I've yet to go in-depth on these things. The Valiant-class super-heavy cruiser was made to command fleets led by admirals and nothing less, with a huge and complex flag bridge at their disposal. This was the chosen command vessel of the lauded Vice Admiral Press in coal, which speaks volumes about its worth. And finally, the Autumn-class heavy cruiser, named in honor of the vessel captained by the legendary Captain Keys. It incorporates the positives of all the previous designs, with the superstructure of the Autumn, the modular design features of the Marathon, the state-of-the-art battle network relays for Valiant-like fleet coordination, as well as the advancements made possible by reverse engineering Covenant and Forerunner tech, like reactive shield plating. I did a video on this one many months back, but it should still be an alright video. I might, I might Right have to get around to redoing that. There is only one UNSC battleship we know of, the Vindication Class Light Battleship, which I've done a video on. You know the drill by now. Created post-war, these are among the most advanced and powerful ships humanity has. Able to down large Covenant ships with relative ease, this thing is shielded and has one of, if not the most powerful Mac we know of. I said this before in that video, but I think the designation Light Battleship, it at least to me, it implies that there are heavier battleships or normal battleships. There's at least some other kind of battleship for them to need the designation light. And the fact that this is lighter than that one, ah, uh, that's something. The biggest boys, the command and control centers of most fleets, packing the largest guns and thickest armor, the carriers of the UNSC are titans. The second smallest of the bunch, the Orion class assault carrier, excels at ground assaults and was, prior to the Human Covenant War, the signature ship of the entire navy. The Epoch class heavy carrier, on the other hand, formed the core of UNSC fleets and could take extreme punishment, making it one of Zenoviet heavy machinery's most lauded creations. The refit Phoenix class support ship is one of the most well known ships in the Halo universe. Unlike in its former life as a colony ship, the Spirit and other refit Phoenixes like her sport war factories that churn out an army's worth of arms, armor, ammunition, vehicles, and fortifications, able to support an entire assault on its own so long as it has the resources to do so. There's this unidentified class that is non canonically referred to as the AI class light carrier. The Poseidon class light carrier has gotten some flack for one, not having a high-res model, the one here was never meant to be gazed upon so closely, and two, having a generally underpowered armament when compared not just to other carriers, but to all other UNSC ships, lacking a spinal mac and a significant amount of missiles while being much smaller than the rest of the carriers. The Punic class supercarrier was, for a long time, the largest UNSC warship, period, and it's noted as being one of the few actually effective at killing Covenant warships, most likely thanks to its two Series 6 Macs that are longer than many UNSC ships in their entirety. And of course, there's the ultimate UNSC capital ship, the great greatest ship that humanity has ever built. Argue about that all you want in the comments, and whether you actually like the ship or not, I know it's divisive, but that statement is true, and if it were used in conjunction with a well-rounded fleet, it would be nearly unbeatable. The Infinity-class supercarrier, the largest ship in the Navy, complete with four of the largest ship-mounted Macs ever constructed, an entire city's worth of crew and complement, shielding, the newly manufactured titanium A3 armor, and hundreds of Spartans living on it. 
The thing is a beast of a ship, and I promise I will eventually stop putting off the breakdown for it. But what do these carriers actually carry? Well, aside from entire frigates in the Punic and Infinities cases, mostly fighters, dropships, and ground forces. The most commonly seen dropships are, of course, the iconic Pelican Line. These are exo-atmospheric troop carriers that you can expect to see on any UNSC battlefield. The D-75TC, D-75TC Recon, and the D-75TC Gunship have no visual representation but are noted to have a larger armament than the typical Pelican, with two belly-mounted turrets and two wing-mounted chain guns. The D-77 troop carrier is the UNSC's standard Pelican variant, used from the Insurrection to the Battle of Installation 04 to the Battle of Zeta Halo. Even civilians have made use of the D-77 Pelican, with the D-77C NMPD variant being used to deploy law enforcement across the sprawling metropolis that was New Mombasa. The D-77 HTC is largely similar to the original D-77, but shorter with greater power generation and a less extensive armament. Isabel and the engineers on the Spirit of Fire have upgraded their own D-77 Pelicans and created the G-77S troop carrier. These are very similar to the D-77H, with a slightly improved armament and likely other alterations. The D-78TC has reduced armor and weaponry than the previous variants, but improved avionics and new thrusters. It also has no visuals. The D-79 heavy troop carrier is the variant created after the end of the war, swapping the wedge design for a more bulbous, rounded look in places. It has more hard points for weapons, and despite looking larger than some previous Pelicans, is actually shorter than the original D-77 by 5 meters. The Gunship 79H variant of the D-79 has a larger armament than the original, and more space for weaponry and ammunition to resupply ground forces. The Liang Dortmund Corporation also makes use of D-79s. These were the companies supplying the recolonization efforts on Meridian. They also supplied them with the Star Charter colony ships we looked at earlier. The Dropship 80, or the D-80 Condor, was the first ever Condor, built from the frame of a D-77 Pelican. These are longer and can carry more troops, but most notably are equipped with a slipspace drive, making these dropships one of the smallest in Halo to have one of those. The D-81 long-range transports are much the same, but instead of a D-77 Pelican frame being used as a foundation, a D-79 was used. The D-81 WP variant is a Condor sold by Misria Armory with an increased armament, and the G81 Condor is a custom heavy gunship variant, and the guns on this thing are just ridiculous looking, but I love it. The D82 EST Darter is the smallest UNSC dropship we know of. These transports deliver resources, munitions, and rations to and from forward operating bases to whatever command centers in the area. In the Spirit's case, the Darters are vital, as they deliver the resources and materials that the Spirit's factories use to create new vehicles and replenish ammunition stores. The D96 TCE Albatross is a heavy lift dropship with no armament but high maneuverability, as well as the expansive cargo bay capable of transporting vehicles, equipment, and up to 50 passengers. And the D20 Heron heavy lift vehicle, featured prominently on the Spirit of Fire, is a super heavy dropship capable of deploying entire forward operating bases. It's my personal theory that something like this would be what deploys a mammoth from the Infinity. Before we move on from the bird named ships, there is also something called a stork that is mentioned and appears in a book one and that is literally all we know is that it's called a stork. There's also a UNSC command shuttle we never get to see that just, you know, ferries VIPs, but here's a Covenant command shuttle to tide you over, I guess. When one thinks of a UNSC fighter, they usually think of one of two things, a longsword or a saber. We'll start with the longsword. Now, ignoring the fact that the longsword is wider than it is long, the GATL-1 Interceptor Strike Fighter is an umbrella term consisting of every variant of longsword we know of. The C-708 longsword is mentioned, but never shown. The C-709 longsword excels at bombing runs on ground targets and can engage enemy ships in a vacuum, can deploy mines, and has a missile delivery system capable of deploying nukes like Shiva's. The C-712 longsword is smaller and faster than the C-709, but largely has the same function and specializes in short-range strike runs. The C-718 longsword is a cutting-edge stealth fighter and has quite a different structure to other longswords, with six large engines on the back and a way bigger armament. As for the FSS-1000 anti-ship space plane, we're gonna ignore that name. The Sabre is more of a traditional idea of a sci-fi space fighter. It specializes in intercepting enemy fighters and bombers, and it's probably one of the smallest shielded ships in the entire Halo universe, which is doubly impressive, as it would be one of the first to get the shielding treatment, being introduced in 2547. The S-930 Strike Fighter, aka the Pegasus, was created as an entry for the Emergency Defense Fighter Initiative, which was a competition put out by the UNSC where shipbuilding companies 
Japanese were challenged to reverse engineer Covenant fighters into something more suited to human use for defense against the alien threat. The Pegasus participated in the Battle of Tribute shown here and all nine combat ready prototypes were destroyed. The uh, the Sabres won that competition. The F-41 exoatmospheric multi-role broadsword was one of the most common strike fighters seen during the Human Covenant War, with tens of thousands of them being produced at the time. Later variants would also include energy shielding. S-14 base lards are far smaller and quite old, requiring two pilots when manned but could be remotely piloted if needed. These have space for two entire M42 Archer missiles and two rotary cannons. That's not Archer Missile Pots, that's, that's just two missiles. They're considered very outdated, although in their heyday against the insurrection, they were unmatched against any rebel anti-air measures. The F-29 Nandau Strike Fighter is apparently so powerful that a Covenant frigate should avoid facing a squadron of them. Deployed in large numbers, these fighters can reach Mach 12, like, holy shit, and are used to overwhelm and neutralize Covenant forces before they can respond. The S-77 Crow is a space fighter we never get to see because book, and since one of its few mentions is intended to be embellishment, we know next to nothing about them. Unusually for a fighter, it's named after a bird, like a dropship, whereas fighters are usually named after types of swords. One of the stranger fighters is the OF-92 booster frame, often deployed from prowlers, and are meant to be used exclusively by individuals wearing Mjolnir, so, you know, Spartans. These are interesting, and I am getting more and more excited to talk about the fighters of the UNSC at a later date. And that is all of the UNSC or modern human ships that are in Halo. But the title of this video wasn't all UNSC ships in Halo or anything like that. There are a couple more human ships you may not have heard of, and two you definitely have not seen because, well, they've never been shown. About 102,500 years before Halo Combat evolved, humanity was a spacefaring civilization. Before the Halo rings reset them to square one, they were on the same level as the Forerunners, apparently going tit for tat in battles. Prime cruisers were apparently a mainstay in their fleets, as well as tuned platforms, which sound more like a, some kind of orbital defense thing. There are also these ships here that we don't really get uh, clarification on what they are. They could be those prime cruisers they mentioned, but we just, we don't know. But that's that's about it. I believe I've covered every known class, but what do you think? Did I miss any? What's your favorite? I know I said a lot of them. I've got another channel and a Discord server if you're into that. I definitely don't have anything particularly well made coming up on Mark the Crawler. Definitely not.